only very quickly introduce uh, the event. Uh, I'm very happy as uh, the co-director of the Global Governance Center to sponsor this event and uh, share it together with the Democracy uh, Center. Uh, we are very happy to organize book lounge for colleagues who just got a book out. Uh, so uh, it's uh, very happily that we do that for uh, Grégoire and his book on uh, Marcel Mauss. Uh, I'm also very happy that there's work produced on French scholars, so that's a very uh, welcome step. Uh, as a French scholar myself, I think it's great that some uh, scholars around us are publicizing their work, publishing in English but on French scholars so that our contribution uh, is made uh, more broadly visible. Uh, so we have uh, four panelists. Uh, <laughs> so far who are going to discuss uh, Gregoire's book. So Anna Leander from the Political Science uh, Department, uh, actually three panelists, I'm sorry, Gopalan Balachandran from the International History uh, Department. The fourth panelist is actually here, so Hugo Paniza. So sorry, I thought it was another place. <laughs> from Economics and uh, Fouad Zarbiev from the International Law Department. Uh, so Gregoire, we let you uh, start with a presentation of your work and then the discussion will follow up. Um, can, I, can I just quickly yes, add a quick welcome to the Democracy Center? Yeah. Uh, uh, we are very excited, not just because it's a great book, and not just because Kagwa is you know, affiliated with our center, but also, you know, as we can see from the panelists, it actually somehow manages to speak across all of the different disciplines at the institute, which you know, is a tradition of interdisciplinarity that our center holds very dear, and also speaks to practices of self-governance, not just in the north, but in the south, which is also something that we're uh, very, uh, it kind of speaks a lot to our own work and uh, that we're looking forward to hearing more about. So, from the Democracy Centre as well, we're very excited to be supporting this book. Thank you. Thank you very much all for coming. Uh, a big thank you to Shalini, the head of the centre, the Democracy Centre, Annabelle and Nico from the Global Government Centre. Anna, who had originally the idea of this book launch. Uh, and who's here in her capacity, of course, also as representative of the CCDP, so the Center ah, for Conflict. Okay, so you're housed by many, you have many homes. That's pretty fun. And Google and Finance and Development. <laughs> <laughs> And so, uh, and and, uh, and my two colleagues. So indeed, we um, uh, it's it's a great pleasure uh, uh, to be here and to present you that book. I'm going to talk briefly about it because I don't want to preempt uh, what my colleagues are going to say about the book, and they may pick up different aspects that falls under the, their specialty. What I just wanted to to do very briefly in 10 to 15 minutes was to to situate the book in the literature and and tell you a little bit the the motivation I had when writing the book and describing what uh, each chapter is doing. Um, so so I, I, uh, I started uh, thinking about this book actually after conversation with one of our former colleagues, Marc uh, Flandreau, uh, who had written a book uh, called Anthropologist in the Stock Exchange, who surveys uh, anthropological or ethnographic practices of British anthropologists at the turn of the uh, 19th, 20th century, and he uncovered their relationship with the uh, 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 corporation of foreign bondholders and their relationship with the stock exchange. Okay, and I realized that actually that the one anthropologist, uh, uh, but whose writing I had uh, written, is writing on sovereign debt during the interwar period. Marcel Mauss. Uh, who uh, wrote quite a lot on uh, sovereign debt crisis around the question of German reparations and the, the, the debt in reparations that Germany didn't want to pay to France and, and Belgium at the time, also had ties to the financial world, although not to the stock market, but to uh, big private uh, investment banks like the Lazar uh, Bank, and that he was very much interested in uh, sovereign debt diplomacy, we could say. And, but at the same time, there were huge differences between uh, how uh, British anthropologists and the French anthropologists around most situated themselves both vis-a-vis -vis field work. Uh, Marcel Mauss was not uh, 
uh, cruising the Caribbean to uh, describe the social mores of uh, uh, distant peoples. Uh, he was very much an armchair anthropologist uh, uh, who, for the most part of his career, could be described as a philologist rather than uh, an anthropologist and who uh, had a chair at the Collège de France as a sociologist. Uh, uh, and he hated the word anthropology, which to him uh, uh, didn't describe his work. He preferred to call it ethnology in contradistinction with the anthropology of the time, which was much more about the natural traits of different populations. So he defined ethnology as we would call now social anthropology, in a sense. Uh, so I thought that, you know, that book on the history of anthropology, of French anthropology, in the context of the disciplines of the time, uh, was missing. And that what Marc had done for the British anthropologists could be done, in a sense, to uh, French anthropology. There was another book that was very much inspirational to me. It's Harry Liberson's book, The Return of the Gift. And Harry Liberson had surveyed uh, political theory and anthropology of the 18th to 19th century to show that actually the model of gift exchange that anthropologists uh, talk so much, especially uh, Marcel Mauss, uh, who was very famous for his essay, The Gift, published in 1925, uh, have been talking in terms of gift exchange to refer to models of global economic governance. Okay. So to think the, about the best way to organize international economic relations between metropolis and colonies, or in the time of the big chartered companies, the chartered company, <coughs> and the local populations that they administer, for instance, the East India Company. And in a sense, this model of gift exchange looked a little bit like what we call today corporate social responsibility of multinationals, uh, if you want to you know, caricature a little bit things. Uh, 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 and at the same time, he showed in his essay how that model of the gift exchange disappeared in the 19th century as a good model of economic governance uh, under the attack of the utilitarian liberals like James Mill, who believed that these sort of interpersonal systems of rulemaking that are based upon the non-contractual non element uh, based on the exchange of material things uh, without clear uh, uh, guideline except for the recognition stemming from interpersonal legal obligation was a very poor way to organize international economic relations. And in, as opposed to that, we would need to organize them according to what the World Bank would call today rule of law. Uh, uh, and that needs to be interpersonal, that needs to be contractualized in a sense. And what he showed is that the model of the gift exchange came back in discussions about international economic governance at, in the late 19th century, first through uh, different uh, uh, German-speaking anthropologists who went to the U.S., and then through Marcel Mauss, uh, as a, well, it was revived as a good model of economic governance. Uh, and most talked a little bit, as I said, about international financial affairs in the context of uh, uh, the reparations debate. But also uh, in his pre-war writing, I discovered by doing field work in his archives and, uh, and doing field work in the archives of associates of most, like Albert Thomas, who was the first director of the ILO, uh, not so far away from here that they also had written and, and, and lobbied, actually, the French Ministry of the Colonies at the time to uh, refer to this model of gift exchange to reframe the uh, relationship that French chartered companies in the Congo had with local populations. And he and others uh, had, had advocated for uh, this other way of thinking of these legal obligations that stem from the work of chartered companies in the Congo in terms of système de prestation réciproque, which is how we translate gift exchange. And actually the system of prestation réciproque, prestation was a legal term uh, 
that we find in many different uh, conventions and treaties, including actually the, the reparations uh, provisions of the Versailles Treaty, uh, uh, which they preferred they, in, a, in a letter to the Minister of the Colony, they said would be better than the world, for instance, forced labor. Uh, that was used sometimes by chartered companies to refer to what local populations owed to them, and in exchange they would provide civilization, but also material infrastructure. So uh, I started basically uh, my work there in the sense that I situated the level at which the concept of gift exchange had relevance at the international level. And in a sense, that's not how we remember gift exchange. Sometimes, in, in fact, in French sociology, uh, where we try now to, when we think about gift exchange, most uh, French economic sociologists, for instance, we think that it's a good concept to describe economic exchanges that are non-market ex forms of exchanges at the local level. You would look at the system economy, uh, uh, solidaire or, or like with alternative currencies, but not to think about broad debates about international economic governance. But, and actually, what we, what, uh, wh one of the ambitions of the book was to, to situate back th the, the discussion of gift exchange at that level, that basically most is talking about international economic relations and best models. And then the ambition of the book was Ari Liberson ends with Mose, was to start with Mose, put it into a, a more deeply into its context and debates with uh, international law scholarship at the time and uh, colonial uh, economics and other disciplines and bring the reader up to the present, looking at how this concept of system de, 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 de prestation réciproque uh, traveled in different literatures, concerns with how the French metropolis could organize uh, its relationship with uh, French colonies and French territories under direct rule, uh, from the con context of the Congo to the context of Algeria and the war of independence <coughs> that uh, occurred in uh, after the Second World War and in which most uh, students, like Jacques Soustel or Germain Tillon, uh, were, uh, had made key interventions in these debates, so they were most uh, PhD students, uh, 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 and we use this concept of the gift exchange to, to reframe in, a, I would say, non-motion, but still it's debatable, way the concept of gift exchange to frame the post-colonial relations that these countries should still have with the French met metropolis. Up to the uh, uh, present context, uh, where a new school, uh, an heterodox school of economists, uh, uh, known as the French school of uh, heterodox e economy around Aglietta, etc., sort of revive this notion of gift exchange in the debate about the Eurozone uh, crisis on how to organize international economic solidarity or international financial solidarity in the post-crisis uh, uh, context of 2009 and beyond. So in a sense, you could read that book as a, as a book of French intellectual history, because as Annabelle said, it's very much about French authors. Uh, although I would say French-speaking authors, uh, because uh, uh, there's a, a large part uh, that shows how uh, key authors in uh, uh, French academia, but Algerian politics uh, and global politics grappled with the, the issues uh, related to the use of the concept of gift exchange in the context of debates about the new international economic order in the 1970s, especially Mohamed Bejawi. Uh, uh, and uh, and uh, but there are so I would say there are not only about French authors but there are about French speaking authors and uh, and maybe it's uh, it's part of my uh, positionality to uh, to think of myself as a translator between different uh, cultures between the francophone and the anglophone uh, academic world. Javi failed as Arabic, so he makes them French. Exactly, exactly. <laughs> that, that <laughs> So, uh, so on that note, uh, I uh, thank you all for being here and look forward to, to hearing uh, uh, your comments.
great. Um, any preferred order about who starts, or should we just start from that side of the room with Ugo? Okay, sure. Well, so first of all, thanks for the invitation. Sorry for being late. I thought it was in A2, and I was desperately looking for everybody in A2. <laughs> um, so, so, you know, I'm completely ignorant of both anthropology and sociology, and the only actually time I heard the most mentioned was when I read this 1982 paper of George Ackerman, mm -hmm. which is titled Labor Contract as a Partial Gift Exchange, where it was most. So, so actually, I learned a lot by reading the book. I, uh, I liked it. And so, so it, it's interesting because I have an ongoing discussion with my wife uh, about inheritance, not about our inheritance, but about different inheritance system. And you know, in certain culture, this is the idea that uh, male uh, get a bigger share of the inheritance, or maybe the first boy gets a bigger share of inheritance, with this implicit idea that this person who gets the uh, bigger share of the inheritance um, takes care of the rest of the family, of the parents or the people who get it. Uh, I, I found this, uh, this rule absurd, but my wife tends to defend it, saying, you know, that please. So I, in fact, reading the book, I still think it is absurd, it's paternalistic, it's inefficient and whatever, but, uh, you know, this book sort of helped me thinking about some of these issues because it's, in a sense, you can think about this as this type of implicit contract that, that, um, that you describe in the book. But one thing that the book made me uh, think harder and was a little bit hinted by Gregoire when he thinks, you know, there was this idea of this gift exchange, and then, you know, you get Mill who says, you know, look, this is not going to work in international relations, and you have this revival, and it's nice how Gregoire ties all this discussion all the way to, you know, the Greek debt crisis. Um, so, if you read this paper, which is really the only thing I knew before reading this book, uh, so this paper basically starts by saying, look, there are a bunch of workers in a factory, and these workers, you know, their productivity is measurable, and, and these workers, they work much more than what is required to them. They're supposed to do 300 pieces an hour, they do 400. They're not really paid more for this, and it's not that people who who produce more or pay more, that it could be done because, right, it's, it's an output which is completely measurable, so I could say I could pay you per piece. And, and, and the idea of the paper that there is this sort of social norms that these workers realize that not everybody can make 500 pieces per hour, and so if in the moment you start getting paid by the piece, you're sort of hurting your friend who's less productive than you, so you get some sort of average pay which is above the normal pay, and then there is, a, you know, and then he builds a mathematical model that shows what type of equilibrium or what kind of situation leads to this. And this idea, and, and he motivates all this thing in all the sociological literature and anthropological literature, going back to Moss and, and stuff. And this, for me, it's very easy to understand because you know we live in a world with, which are implicit contracts, right? So we are paid by an institute, and the institute can sort of monitor our teaching and a little bit other stuff, but we do, you know, my parents are surprised, like you're paid to teach 100 hours a year and you're always working, you're crazy, right? So this is like a part of a, a bunch of implicit contracts. What, what it's harder for me uh, to understand is how this concept, which I think is what the book uh, tries to do, but I think we need to understand more, is how you translate this sort of uh, micro-level implicit contracts, which I think are very, uh, uh, not very easy, but relatively easy to understand, to uh, this macro-level implicit contract. So because when you think about the relationship between two countries, you know, you are, first of all, you know, when you think about the relationship between uh, individuals, there are individual sentiments, and that's what I'm maximizing. If I'm a president of a country or a policymaker in a country, first of all, my mandate should be to maximize the well-being of my citizen, not to maximize my own feeling or whatever it is. That, you know, I might do that, but that should be my mandate. So you would think that this type of exchange should be uh, more structured and less driven by these implicit contracts which are represented in this gift exchange. I guess this was the argument that Mills was doing, right? Uh, and plus there is the fact that, again, when you think about this gift exchange between people, you have 
two people interacting, and they're always the same people, and there again, you have two, uh, <coughs> you know, two countries or, or two players, but you know, the individual change. So you, you, you might think that this uh, reputation of gift exchange needs to translate from the individual to the state or to the corporation or to whatever, which it seems again a more uh, problematic translation. So, uh, so I don't have answers for this, but I think that I, I like the book because it, it made me think about all this uh, sort of stuff. Great, uh, Anna. <laughs> okay, thank you. Uh, and uh, yes, thank you for uh, allowing me to discuss this. It's been a pleasure reading it. And <clears throat> uh, I could say a lot of things about this, but I'm just going to insist on three contributions that I think the book is making to international relations, which happens to be my home discipline, uh, and then sort of prompt a couple of questions uh, on these three contributions. So it's a fantastically well-informed book, and it's, uh, I, I'm in awe of all the, you said you did field work in archives, and it really shines through. It's an extremely detailed account of something, of uh, how this idea uh, of gift exchanges as developed by Moles uh, travels and um, becomes, actually is extremely political. So a sort of a core fundamental point that Gregoire makes is that um, you know, Moles actually wrote this as much as an academic idea, it was a political idea, and he really promoted it as such. And, uh, Grégoire, uh, Annabelle introduced this saying, oh, uh, Grégoire does it. Um, it's nice to see someone working on French uh, <laughs> thinkers. Well, most did exactly the same to the English world, and uh, this is one of the reasons, as Grégoire shows in the book, why this idea traveled so broadly in academia. But it also traveled uh, politically, and the political idea, and I think I didn't, I, I think I, I have read a little bit of Moss and a little bit of anthropology and a lot of international relations, but I hadn't, I didn't know this at all, and I found it extremely interesting. So the way Grégoire presents it is that the idea of the gift as promoted by uh, Moss in the interwar <coughs> period is basically a way of coming to terms with the problem of international political order. Uh, so not only it's not only local, it's actually a way of coming to terms with this world of states that uh, cannot find out how to govern themselves, uh, and they don't have any common rules. And Moss basically writes this idea about how in traditional societies where uh, at the time primitive societies, where there were no sort of common ways of organizing exchanges, you could rely on gifts to do this. Uh, so, and this, of course, for international relations, this is the fundamental problem of uh, international relations conventionally conceived is, you know, how do we manage to create order in a system of sovereign states where there's no superior uh, order of law which we can refer to and therefore uh, derive order from. So this is actually, for my discipline, a big idea. Uh, I, it's, uh, and I didn't, like, I don't know if this is, I don't think it's common, I've read a lot of French IR as well. I don't think it's common uh, to think of uh, the solution um, in these terms. And Grégoire does a fantastic job of showing how uh, this idea uh, for how to create political order through gift exchange and inspired by his reading, not his fieldwork of anthropology, travels first into the political sphere of the discussions around German reparations and then uh, further after the Second World War and then up to the present. So uh, basically draws a wonderfully detailed history of this. And this is, I, I think this is really a big contribution. I want to say that. Now, uh, I think it also raises, and this is more, so I, have, I find it very interesting to think about this. Uh, when I was reading the book, often I was thinking that you know, maybe one could have done more, and, I, I, and that's unfair to say, it's a fantastic book, but anyway, I'll do it. Um, uh, maybe one could have done more to uh, be explicit, not only on the fact that this idea came to be used to promote order, but what it then actually did to the order. And, you know, Gregoire in his, in his uh, 
forward to the volume says, oh, uh, you know, my wife will castigate me forever for not doing the more ambitious volume about the politics of race and gender and this and so on, and that's much too much. And I just wish that, you know, a hint occasionally to what it was doing, like a stronger one, that would have been so welcome. And I would, you know, if you can sort of just push a couple of points along those lines. Um, and that comes under the heading, fantastic general contributions. Could we have more about, you know, what it actually did to them, um, uh, to racial, colonial uh, being? And you show that you show it's there, but it's somehow, I felt like it's there, but what did it do? Uh, and the second contribution, which I also really appreciate, and it's, a, it's also a contribution of the big kinds, is a contribution to how we think about the history of ideas. So for various reasons, and this is true both in French sociology, I think, and in, uh, especially in uh, English-speaking uh, sociology and political theory, we've come to do history of ideas in a very asociological manner. So uh, we often trace concepts and ideas you know, from the one to the other and how they open up on each other. We do genealogies a la Foucault. Uh, that are really interesting but are really profoundly asociological in the sense that the concepts and the ideas somehow travel mystically from one place to the next. And uh, Grégoire does quite the opposite. So it's almost gossipy, uh, like you, <laughs> you sort of see Grégoire going gossiping through the archives, you know, about who said what to who and there and that's there and everyone is linked. And since I'm not so good at gossiping, I'm like, I, I'm completely in awe of this. Like I find it just retracing this is, is absolutely admirable. And he does so uh, drawing on, so when I said the tendency has been to asociologize the history of ideas, uh, of course that's, uh, it's as always, uh, things aren't uniform. So of course there are people who, who do this uh, kind of sociological work as well. Uh, and you draw on Bourdieu and you draw on Steinmetz, fantastic uh, work on the devil's handwriting in the German context. Um, and I just wanted, I can't help but to do this, and you sort of present yourself, and maybe, and I'd like to, you say, uh, so for me this makes so much sense, and you have a good, uh, uh, the first chapter has a very nice sort of overview of the French academic field, uh, uh, when this emerges, and. Uh, and how this was, uh, and so basically two questions about methodology. One is, um, so as I made very clear, so a core point here is about the international traveling uh, of this concept, right? Uh, and Grégoire somehow see, thinks that he couldn't possibly have done this with Bourdieu alone. And I felt like, well, why not? You know, there's nothing like thinking in terms of fields and so on. You know, uh, and actually Bourdieu, although at the end of his life, the cunning of imperialist reason and so on, is clearly uh, you take the field beyond the nation state. So I find it a bit gratuitous, like, you know, did you really, like, and then also, did you go far enough? Like, couldn't you have pursued this further? Because it sort of stops, there's a first chapter that does a little bit of this, as if it only mattered there, and then that, that part is sort of evacuated from the other chapters, and it becomes a more sort of process tracing or a, a sort of a tracing of how the concept travels through the discussions. So I'd like to push you a little bit on that method side as well and say, okay, um, could you, you know, could you have gone more into detail and used it more systematically and would that have done anything to you? And my, of course, my suspicion is that it would. But anyway, second thing. Uh, and then the third thing I find very interesting. So, um, uh, as you pointed out, you draw this into the contemporary political context, uh, where, of course, in a very different way, we're in um, an anarchic system that is no longer mainly about states, but about um, neoliberal forms where the, the in international relations, of course, this occupies a lot of space. You know, what do we do in a world where international relations clearly are no longer mainly about states, but a lot of uh, multi, uh, multiple actors of various sorts. Maybe it always was, but now we're clearly in a situation where it's very difficult to imagine it otherwise, even if you're extremely uh, conservative uh, in, in intellectual terms when you're thinking about this. 
and you and you say, and now it's sort of coming back in the context of the financial crisis, and you have Alietta, the French regulation school, so Alietta and Oignon, who are again, uh, you say, but actually I wonder if I could push you a little bit on that, because that argument is very thin. Because the, you say they, we, they hark back to Moss, but you, they, I wonder how they do that, because do, did they need more than the mimetics? So you talk about the, sorry, this gets a little bit, but. Anyway, so the idea of thinking that financial markets work uh, through crowd dynamics and therefore involve mimetic processes um, in, the, in the speculation uh, is a classic. So there's been quite a lot, and they pick up on this, I guess. Uh, but then you somehow say that they also pick up on the gift exchange, and I didn't quite get how that was working. And so I was curious about that. Could you like please elaborate? It's not very clear, or, or maybe I, I'm just slow-witted, so I didn't get it. Uh, and But the other thing I was saying, so uh, your conclusion seems to be, uh, if I get that right, that, th that the gift exchange loses its efficiency as a way of thinking order once you <laughs> get into a neoliberal, uh, completely speculative context. Uh, and for me, it's quite, I've been involved for a number of years now in a project on different ways in which rituals of which give giving would obviously be one, an example, is part of generating international order. So I wondered, isn't it possible to think, and this is really an open question, uh, unlike the other one, which is a clarification question, uh, could one imagine that gift giving uh, could function to uh, shift uh, the context out of the economy, so to speak, and sort of generate order otherwise in a completely neoliberalized context? Because one of the things that I find interesting about the way you use the gift giving is that you really, you think about the economic order uh, particularly. Like you remain very much, in terms of the thinking, it's as if political order in the way you conceive of it is mainly about the economic side of things. But couldn't one think of gift giving as sort of moving elsewhere, like help move it out of a neoliberal where everything is governed just through a neoliberal logic, et cetera, that you very, very well described and uh, sh shift to orders that are uh, otherwise done. And I think this is quite, like one could have raised that through the entire volume, but I think it becomes particularly strong in the present because it seems to me that politically, uh, that's where it's most interesting. So, thank you. Thanks, Anna. Uh, yes. uh, thank you, Annabelle, and uh, thank you to the various centers that have sponsored <laughs> this event. And thank you, Gregoire, for making this event possible uh, with this book. Congratulations. When I first uh, heard that you were researching Moss's archives and you're interviewing Ben Chavi, I was curious as to what the connection was and what the outcome would be. Uh, my curiosity has been more than satisfied. Uh, <laughs> I. I enjoyed reading the book, especially the gossip, uh, even though uh, it involved uh, navigating some very strange in French intellectual ideas. I've always been stumped uh, by the normative positivism that, in my opinion, seems to uh, dominate a lot of French intellectual reflections, and it's kind of interesting to see this kind of normative positivism, as it were, in full bloom in Moss's work as well as uh, in, in Gregoire's uh, uh, recounting of, uh, of, of, of his work. Uh, I've also been very amused generally by the plight of the European socialists in the interwar period as they try to navigate between, uh, you know, the liberal uh, international political and economic order in which they had, uh, to which they had some commitment, but they were not entirely committed, and of course the Bolsheviks, whom they hated more than they disliked liberalism. And it's kind of interesting to see how some of these conflicts play out uh, in Moss's reflections on one of those great issues that divided uh, 
the international, uh, com the European uh, intellectual community at that time and the political community at that time, which is the issue of reparations, to which I would also add the issue of inter-allied war debts. Uh, so I learned a great deal, especially from your uh, effort to recontextualize uh, Moss's contribution uh, uh, in the background of inter-allied war debts and uh, the reparations. Uh, and I found it hugely uh, thought-provoking, and, 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 and I want to share uh, with you some ideas which uh, your... Uh, uh, book uh, provoked me in the direction of, uh, of, of uh, outlining here. Uh, it seems to me that one way to uh, kind of go from Moss and the idea of the gift uh, to thinking about uh, historical political economy and, and the international system is to think of uh, the reciprocity of the gift <coughs> as being situated adjacently to two other reciprocal uh, relationships, which is the tributary relationship and the debt relationship. I'm not saying that there is a, some kind of a linear uh, teleology which takes us from the world of the gift to the world of the debt, but that often you know, there are intersecting boundaries uh, where I think uh, we could have some very interesting uh, uh, perspectives. Uh, you know, one of the things that uh, the European socialists, uh, uh, you know, were really confronted by, uh, as opposed to the liberals and the Bolsheviks and the communists, was the question of how do we reassert uh, the control of the community over capital, right? And, uh, and of course, uh, you know, socialists between Ricardo and Marx wrestled with this question. Uh, they had the great advantage, however, of not having to wrestle with this question in a world of nation states. And Moss is reflecting on this question, not only in a world of nation states, but in a world deeply polarized by the First World War and all the you know, cultural, political, and economic conflicts that uh, the First World War brought in its wake. Uh, and you can see that Moss is struggling with the idea of how to reconcile the idea of the nation and the state with that of the community with which I would imagine the socialists were far more comfortable. And you can see this divide actually leading to the rift within the socialists that you outline uh, so well in this book. Uh, now, to move to my other major point about the adjacency of the three uh, relationships. I cut my teeth as a historian in working on uh, uh, the interwar uh, macroeconomic system, in which, of course, the inter-allied war debts were a big issue, in a colonial context, right? So let me take you a little bit to the colonial context, because that's very crucial uh, to your work, and especially, uh, you know, Bejawi's uh, uh, attempt to kind of work with and beyond uh, Moss uh, in the context of the new international economic order. Uh, if you look at the relations between, say, the East India Company and, uh, you know, the various uh, sovereigns in India, and especially the Mughal sovereign, and this is paralleled by relations between chartered companies and various uh, uh, sovereigns with treaty rights in all parts of the world, what you first have is a gift relationship in which there is an exchange of gifts, all right? Uh, recognize, however symbolic, uh, recognizing each other's sovereignty, or in the case of the East India Company, recognizing the sovereignty of the Mughal Emperor. Right? Now, I don't want this to be mistaken for some kind of a linear teleo teleological view, but what you find over a period of time is that this gift relationship yields to a tributary relationship uh, in which uh, not only is the East India Company repudiating this gift, gift relationship, but A, it's laying claims to the tributes that the Mughal emperor received from his, you know, sub-feudatories, uh, 
and over a period of time actually laying claim to tributes from the Mughal emperor himself. Right? Now, so there is an equation here of power which kind of moves the gift relationship to one of a tributary relationship. But what is interesting for me, again, looking at the history of the colonial relationship, is what happens to the relationship between debt and tribute when the debtor is not the colony, but the metropole. Right? And uh, you have evidence for this, for example, in the colonial context after the two world wars, when uh, you know, Britain ended up, and I'm speaking here for Britain, and you know, since I don't know the French uh, colonial context so well, when Britain ended up being indebted uh, to the colonies. All right. So I'm quoting this from memory. Uh, December 31st, 1919. Uh, this is uh, the, uh, a top official in the British Treasury writing about the debts that Britain owed to India after the First World War. And he notes this as follows. If India insists on its debts being settled by the payment of precious metals, Britain would be doing a doubtful service to the rest of the world in protecting India from the Mongol raiders of ancient times who from time to time rid India of its store of precious metals. So you can see here how Basil Blackett, that's the name of the official, is actually boundary crossing between the world of debt and the world of tribute. And what happens in 1920? In 1920, Britain liquidates uh, you know, its debts to India by ensuring that India's sterling assets would be expended in costly exchange intervention. So over a period of about six months, Britain pretty much extinguishes its debt to India, not by repaying the debt to India, but in fact, you know, trans tra you know translating that debt relationship into a tributary relationship. Something similar happen, happens after the Second World War. Uh, you know, and th th there are now more papers about this. Uh, you know, after the Second World War, uh, we know Keynes, uh, by the way, after the First World War, we all know that Britain wanted the Americans to cancel its war debts and make that a condition for renegotiating reparations. So Britain was far more uh, committed actually to the cancellation of American war debts than uh, we often uh, suppose. And you have the same thing after the Second World War, when Britain wanted American, uh, the Lend-Lease uh, debts to be canceled. And you have Keynes going to the uh, pre bretton Woods conference, I forget now where it took place. Uh, you know, uh, hoping that the Americans would, uh, could kind of cancel war debts. You have Churchill fuming that of all countries, Britain owed war debts to India. And in fact, threatening the repudiation of those debts. And Keynes, in fact, gets very, very uh, upset with the Indian delegation to the Bretton Woods Commission, Bretton Woods Conference, when they refused to, uh, you know, negotiate uh, over uh, inter-allied or British war debts. What happens after that? Indian, uh, you know, uh, credits, that is British war debts to India, are liquidated in three ways. The first of all liquidated through overpricing, because soon we have 1946 and 1947, overpricing the assets that the British were leaving behind in India when they leave in 1947. Secondly, it's liquidated by paying India an interest rate of quarter to half a percent on its assets as against the rate that Britain was paying on all its other debts of two and a half to three percent. And then in 1948, August, Britain devalues the pound by 40 percent, 30 percent, somebody would know the exact figure, 
def in in one stroke, therefore, you know, uh, uh, you know, reducing India's uh, its debts to India by thirty or forty percent. So it's been calculated that through these means, Britain pretty much uh, liquidated forty percent of its war debts to India. All right. So what you have here is that in a situation where the debt is owed by the more powerful country to the less powerful country, right? Uh, these debt relationships can take on the aspect, if you like, of you know a discourse of gift. You know, we are protecting India from raiders of ancient times. We have protected India from Nazi or Japanese invasion, right? Uh, as well as in the language of tribute, which is that India is paying us a tribute for all the benefits that colonialism is uh, conferring on it. So it seems to me that you know the the idea of the gift opens up extremely interesting perspectives uh, into international political economy and into international governance. But once you bring the colonial world or the post-colonial world into the picture, it seems to me that we'd have to kind of uh, recontextualize uh, you know gift relationships in the context of both tributary and debt relationships and the fact that. You know the 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 the, uh, the moral universe of the debt somehow is not uh, uh, shall we say uh, unrelated to the power relations within which debts are contracted and debts are as it were uh, liquidated. So just to uh, you know uh, bring this very quickly uh, up to date, you know I I I would be hard put to conclude uh, whether an act of a sovereign creditor waiving a particular country's debt while a part of a particular country's debt while selling the other part off to vulture funds or hedge funds is an act of solidarity or is it an act of mendacious hypocrisy? Yeah, so I'll leave it there. Thank you, Annabelle, uh, and thank you, my co-panelists, who have made actually some of the points I wanted to make, so they made my task easier. It's a pleasure to be here on the occasion of the launch of uh, Gregoire's important book, which I read uh, and enjoyed reading, and from which I learned uh, a great deal. I was telling Gregoire before we started that I used plenty of flags, and I, I told him that this is actually a good practical illustration of the law of diminishing return in economics, basically, when you have so many uh, flags, because there's actually basically uh, everything, in, on every page there is something to, to highlight. Basically, you, you lose the utility, because you're completely lost. <laughs> uh, so uh, let me start sim saying by something that will make me very popular with my colleagues. Uh, we usually pride uh, ourselves at this institute on being interdisciplinary and on promoting interdisciplinarity. But interdisciplinarity is the kind of thing academics talk a lot, but practice very little. It's, uh, it's a nice uh, slogan. Uh, in the example of this institute, we have uh, several departments, as you can see, they are all uh, represented on, on this panel. But I see them as, uh, at least oftentimes, hermetically sealed uh, from each other, which I don't see as a great sign of uh, interdisciplinarity. Uh, but uh, there are exceptions, and uh, Gregoire features prominently among those exceptions. And this book is a strong evidence of it, if anyone needed uh, evidence. It is interdisciplinarity in action. <coughs> it is, the, it is uh, walking the walk of interdisciplinarity, not just talking the talk of it. So we should be grateful to Gregoire for offering us uh, such a, uh, an amazing book and feel privileged to have him with us. Now, there is a reason why I started with interdisciplinarity, because I want to make a broader point that will take me to uh, 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 Gregoire's book, um, which, and one of the great beauty of the book precisely is that it forces you to think about big picture points uh, you would not have thought uh, otherwise. So uh, uh, this is actually something I, uh, I, I discussed with Gregoire once, so it's not going to uh, 
le prendre au dépourvu, as they say in French. So people who practice interdisciplinarity uh, are usually, I think, probably uh, ex uh, unanimously, I would say, I, I'm not aware of any exception, and it would be inconsistent conceptually, relativists, philosophically speaking. So they don't believe in objective reality that would be out there independently of uh, human perspectives. Now, if you consider the sales pitch for interdisciplinarity, I think you would see uh, uh, something I, I would call the paradox of interdisciplinarity. And let me explain what I mean by it. So the usual sales pitch for interdisciplinarity goes something like this. So if you analyze any phenomenon from a single perspective, you're not going to have the full picture. So if you want to understand the phenomenon in full, you have to uh, bring to the table multiple pers perspectives, hence interdisciplinarity. So as the old phenomenologists used to say, it's impossible to see a cube with its six faces, six sides. So interdisciplinarity is supposed to be a tool or a device to overcome that difficulty. But the problem with that approach is that uh, uh, it's not available uh, to a relativist or social constructivist uh, to say such a thing, because that would be assuming that there is such a thing as objective reality independent of human perspectives. Once you admit that the perspective is uh, uh, what builds the object being analyzed, uh, uh, it means that bringing multiple perspectives cannot mean that you would see an object in a new light. You would see actually a completely different object, a new object, which may be what you're interested in. Now, that takes me to Gregoire's book, more precisely to its discussion of international law. I assume that's what I am here to talk about. I, I am from the international law department. Uh, now, the book contains one of the most fascinating discussions of uh, uh, new international economic order um, uh, I am aware of, and I have uh, read uh, uh, quite a bit about um, that chapter of international uh, law, because I find it fascinating. I think it's one of the most fascinating chapters in the intellectual history of international law. Uh, it's fascinating and it's deeply illuminating in many respects. But I, I was wondering whether it's also a story that international lawyers, I see a couple of them in the room, uh, they may confirm or, or how they they feel about it if they, they got an opportunity to read Pregois' book. But the international lawyers would recognize as a better explanation of an uh, episode in the history of international law they are more or less familiar with, or something completely uh, different. Now, I, I can make several points uh, on that, uh, but I would just limit myself to one point. Basically, Bejawi's role in uh, uh, promoting the new international economic order, or I wouldn't say bringing about it because I don't think that new international economic order has has been brought uh, about. That's one of the things Gregoire uh, discusses. Um, uh, it's it's unfair to to tell an author that he missed something he was not supposed to see, and Gregoire specifies at the beginning of the book and over the course of the book in multiple places that. He's interested in the francophone field of power and, and law. So in that sense, it makes perfect sense to focus on Bejawi, who undoubtedly was a, a major um, uh, actor. But I, uh, I, I got the impression, at least uh, sometimes, that it, it, it read uh, as a sort of one-man show. Bejawi really uh, was, uh, you know, the, the sort of uh, the, the key decisive actor. Um, I'm not sure whether you got a chance to talk to Georges Abissab, who used to teach uh, at this institute, who was also one of the major uh, uh, actors um, those days. Uh, he would radically disagree with that account, which doesn't mean that it's, it's inaccurate, but I think you know there were so many other international lawyers, Norman Girwan, uh, Abissab was another one, R.P. Anand uh, from India, but one thing I, uh, I think should be highlighted, it's, it's lost on so many international legal scholars writing on third world perspective, and we should be grateful to Gregoire for bringing it to, uh, uh, to the table. 
the Western legal training of early third world uh, scholars uh, in international law. Uh, uh, there is a, uh, for international lawyers in the room, there is a movement uh, uh, in international legal scholarship called TWAIL, Third World Approaches to International Law, and there are many uh, representatives uh, of that movement. We are going to host one of them actually pretty soon as a visiting professor, Chimney from India. But they say that there was a first generation Tweili and they put Bejawi, uh, Abisab, Aman in, in that category. But it's misleading because it sounds like these people were all trained in their home countries and they, they were successful in bringing about a certain amount of change in the, uh, the way national law was conceptualized. But that was not the picture. And as Gregoire uh, beautifully explained, uh, there was at least a major part of the explanation was the Western legal training, which enabled them to speak the language of uh, uh, international law with their uh, uh, Western counterparts. As uh, Derrida once said, the only way to pretend uh, that you speak Chinese to Chinese is to speak Chinese. So uh, that's, you know, if you want to speak international law language with uh, Western international lawyers, you have to speak uh, that language. And they did it in different capacities, right? There is a nice uh, contribution by Abi Saab I mentioned earlier, uh, uh, third world intellectual in praxis, and he mentions three ways of engaging with national law of these intellectuals or scholars, confrontation, participation, and operation behind enemy lines. And I think it, it, it summarizes uh, their contribution quite well. Now, uh, I, I have uh, uh, quite a um, few other points, but uh, let me focus on two uh, uh, maybe uh, suggestions or, or questions. It, it depends how you would take them. One is um, I very much enjoy reading the, 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 the intellectual history uh, part of the uh, you know the, the new international economic order, but I was wondering whether there was something missing there, uh, which is, again, it's, it's deeply unfair because you were not supposed to focus on it. Uh, but I think it, the intellectual history would not be complete if, so for the South, you have uh, scholars, you, uh, and you emphasize their role. But for the North, I got the impression that uh, you only focus on states and you sort of, um, uh, 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 <coughs> Uh, uh, put to side uh, uh, the contribution of Western international legal scholars. Now it's fascinating to see how back then the discourse of Western international legal scholars were completely identical with the position of their government. Now that tells you something about the grip of ideology. So supposedly independent academics promoting views that accidentally coincide with their government's view. You know, there are many examples, Prosper Weil, Derek Bowett, Robert Jennings, uh, Francis Mann, And they were using a lot of techniques. One of them actually was denigration. I, I have a quote here. Uh, Mann once said, um, uh, hardly any right of standing has failed to support the rule on compensation or nationalized property. Uh, Lilik, uh, American National Law Scholar, once said about a famous uh, piece by Guha Rari on state responsibility, he said it was such a superficially reasoned piece that it didn't need uh, an answer. So I know that this, it was not the goal uh, you know, to provide a full intellectual history, but I think the picture would not be complete if one also does not focus uh, uh, on this intellectual confrontation between the scholars from the north and south. Now, in the interest of time, I will just make one last point. Um, uh, coming to the paradigm of GIFT, I, find, uh, I found deeply illuminating. As Bala just said, it opens up so many perspectives about uh, uh, the world and uh, the way we should think about um, uh, uh, global problems. Now, uh, I, I, I have one question and one suggestion. My question uh, is, uh, it was not clear to me uh, 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 what is the role that you give the paradigm of GIFT. Is it something that you sort of uh, claim that 
secretly animated the debates, uh, you know, to use uh, Foucault's famous phrase in genealogy piece, uh, on new international economic order, it's a sort of, uh, intellectual reconstruction because there is a sort of intellectual debt to that um, uh, discussion, um, uh, uh, concept um, uh, introduced by, by Moth. And uh, another question I have, oh, it's a suggestion, so you you jump from the new international economic order to uh, the the eurozone conflict, uh, which is a fascinating case study, uh, of course. But I was wondering uh, whether you you have conceded and maybe you have dismissed as being irrelevant to your discussion some other pages in the chapters in the history of international law, which at least intuitively looked relevant to me. I will give two examples. One is all the debates in the law of the sea, or actually in some other areas as well, about exploitation of resources outside national jurisdiction. jurisdictions. Now, one big example is uh, a deep seabed. Uh, uh, so law of the sea convention came up with this uh, concept of common heritage of mankind. So even though development countries don't have technological capability to exploit those resources, it doesn't mean that it's the law of jungle and it's anything goes and only rich countries would have access to it. So there's an institutional mechanism that put, put together, it doesn't work at all, but I think the idea uh, may be interesting to explore. And another one would be this concept, especially used in the climate change regime, this idea of common but differentiating responsibility, differentiated responsibility, this idea that you know, we should treat developing countries uh, differently from uh, rich countries. I, I was wondering whether you see any, any relevance to the gift paradigm in that context. Thank you very much for this uh, great achievement. Well, thanks, uh, Fouad, and thanks to uh, all of you. Uh, Grégoire, would you like to say a few words, or yes? Sure, I, I'll be brief, because uh, I'll, uh, I'll say that basically I'm not going to respond to all, but uh, uh, thank you to, to, to have read this, uh, this book, and uh, I will respond in many discussions that we'll have over the years, uh, uh, which is a, a good way to... Kind of criticisms, <laughs> but it, but it's true that there's a, there's a lot uh, uh, in what you said. I'm just going to take <laughs> a, a few points. Um, I think the the point that uh, both Anna and Bala made on whether we could study not just uh, how the gift exchange model was conceived but what it did to international economic relations or to other types of social relations uh, is a very important point. Um, because uh, one of, uh, when you use one concept that highlights some aspects of reality but that obscures other aspects. And I think uh, you're very much right to emphasize that it's particularly important to situate uh, how, what practical effects people, academics, intellectuals, or policymakers, or uh, uh, colonial administrators, or uh, economic policy uh, planners sought when they deployed this metaphor of the gift exchange, or this uh, political idea of the gift exchange, in specific contexts to achieve specific results. Um, uh, and it's true that maybe uh, in the book I placed too much emphasis on what they tried to achieve but not on what they managed to obscure. And, you're, and on that I will, uh, I, will, uh, I will say that one of the uh, limitation of the perspective of such intellectual history that uh, uh, follows uh, how actors have uh, uh, deployed the notion of the gift exchange in specific controversies uh, is that you, uh, you emphasize 
uh, this positive uh, dimension and you tend to de-emphasize the negative dimension. Uh, epistemologically, I take also your point to have much relevance today in the sense that do anthropologists and sociologists we still use the notion of gift exchange, although at the micro level, as Hugo said, uh, since Akerlof and since many others, this concept has moved from the macro to the micro. What do they obscure? Uh, when we do not talk about gender, uh, 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 when we do not talk about race relations, but we talk about this gift exchange that is supposed to be a way through which these other notions uh, lose their relevance, what are we doing? So in a, in a sense, uh, there's this other history to be written about our disciplines. Um, now, at the same time, to go back uh, to Bala's point on the malleability of that notion and uh, its ability to morph into uh, uh, other forms of uh, relations, especially I, I really uh, fan, fan, fantastic your comment about the, the way the notion of gift exchange sometimes uh, easily uh, decays into notions of tributary relationships and, and debt relationship. Uh, and I would say that I, uh, I agree that uh, I would say that most of the European socialists around most were very much aware of this uh, hypocritical or mendacious use of that notion, which was used not only by those who, like them, uh, wanted to socialize the means of production or the means of exchange, especially uh, between nations, and uh, who sought, let's say, a more fair uh, uh, way to organize uh, trade. Uh, but, they were also, but it was also a notion that was used by a bit everybody from the vulture funds of the time to uh, the chartered companies that had uh, little ambition to develop uh, uh, countries. And it, it, it morphed into these predatory practices uh, often because sometimes when you ask uh, uh, people to work uh, and to be paid in kind, uh, uh, it hides uh, dark purposes rather than just giving you salary that can be the object of collective conventions uh, uh, and, uh, and that's what uh, most and people around him was uh, uh, criticizing uh, um, in, the, in the colonial context. So in a sense, what I, what I try to show in the book is how these authors are very much aware of this uh, very strategic use of the term, but they do not challenge the ideal. So for them, they are very much uh, aware of the fact that the notion of gift exchange and the legal forms of contracting that, or quasi-contracting that are associated with that notion could hide duplicitous purposes, but they did not challenge the concept itself as an ideal. They challenged bad uses of the concept, uh, but they never uh, tried to put in its place, for instance, market relations as the best way to organize uh, international economic exchange, uh, or you know, pure and perfect contracts. They are not trying to make the implicit in the contract explicit as opposed to what many, for instance, uh, economists may be tempted to do, to say basically the market is very good when uh, you sort of decrease the amount of informality uh, in, in, uh, in the contract because basically you underpay your worker if, is, uh, if what it does is largely invisible to the employer. And so it's an unfair uh, 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 relationship. So you could think that actually the, the goal is to have perfect market in the sense that all the information on what is delivered uh, is shared by both employer and employee, to take uh, the metaphor. Like, uh, so that's not at all what these uh, anthropologists are saying. They are not trying to substitute to the ideal of gift exchange another ideal, which may be the ideal of the market, of the, the free and pure market. And that's one of the limitations we could say uh, uh, um, 
of uh, what they are doing, whether, uh, and that's in a sense the, uh, what, I, um, uh, what I think happens when uh, the, the concept itself becomes the object of much criticism uh, by some uh, international law scholars is that they want maybe to get rid of the concept as an ideal rather than keep it and track the, the misuses of the concept just propose new uh, concepts. And in a way, uh, one of the open questions is whether we have invented other concepts than those, <coughs> gift exchange, market exchange, in these pure forms, uh, or and whether the, the concepts that FWAD is, uh, is uh, listing common heritage of mankind or uh, common but differentiated responsibility can be used as new concepts that enlarge our uh, political vocabularies. Um, this I will not ask. Now, now just briefly on, uh, on the methods, uh, just to answer Anna and, uh, and Fouad's comment uh, uh, on both the geographical and temporal ex expansion of the survey of authors I read you in the book. I completely uh, uh, endorse the criticisms that, that it's not an exhaustive survey of all the authors who have either participated in some of the movements uh, which I, I uh, describe in the book, uh, for instance, you will not read anything on Lévi-Strauss, uh, sorry. Uh, uh, there are other great books uh, on Lévi-Strauss. Uh, we have one colleague at Juni, Jevassa de Ban, who has written on, on him. Uh, uh, we have indeed lots of uh, key figures of the uh, new international economic order uh, on uh, whom I have uh, done little research, and, uh, and this is, of course, a limitation uh, if my goal was to do a complete history, but as it was said, it's not. That's why I said no, no, but, I <laughs> but, uh, but it's true that uh, if you were going to read that book to do a uh, history of the NIO, it would be really incomplete. It would give you one uh, aspect of it, uh, but one limited one. Uh, and it's also true that um, temporally, I would say that it's a discontinuous history. Uh, I selected a few controversies. <coughs> in which this notion of gift exchange as a political ID was deployed, but I, and of course, uh, 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 I, I tried to find when there were links uh, between uh, people who participated in these controversies, I, I tried to uncover those links to understand some filiation, but it's not uh, a continuous history of the concept. Uh, and I would say that uh, the subjective element was uh, uh, my own subjectivity, my own subjective interest in uh, these controversies largely explains how I sampled. Uh, uh, there's uh, a, a very uh, uh, subjective research design being applied here. Uh, uh, so don't follow that uh, if you are a graduate student. <laughs> Uh, this is not a, a book that you, you should emulate for its methodological components. Um, on, the, on, the, on the field aspects, um, I, do be, I, I do agree with you that Bourdieu at the end of his career gestured toward the possibility that imperial relations uh, matter to explain the expansion of the field. But uh, like always with Bourdieu, uh, you're finding in, uh, I would say, position papers, but it's something different when you, when you really take seriously uh, this uh, proposition uh, and when you actually conduct uh, uh, actual research. And I still think that there's a, a big gap from Bourdieu to Steinmetz, for instance, and to the, these authors who have tried to seriously uh, considered uh, the, the notion of field purely in the national context and those who have tried to see if that really makes sense in the transnational context. And that is a discussion that uh, we could have you know, between IR and sociology scholars on whether the, the, the concept of field is not completely diluted 
eventually when you place it in the transnational and international context, uh, you can still uh, uh, try to save it by calling it a weak field that looks then a, a bit like a space or an arena, but no longer like a field in the sense that a key component of the field is whether the field can reproduce itself on the next generation, which means that you need to have not only institutions of policy making, but also institutions of education and higher education to reproduce the next generation uh, and to train the next generation according to uh, uh, the type of social capital you want to uh, value and the type of forms of knowledge you want to value. And when you do that, uh, you actually uh, have to pay a lot of attention to the, 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 the schools uh, that populate the field and not only to the transnational policy networks. Uh, um, and this is something that indeed, like maybe the new generation of board union scholars have started doing, but I wouldn't, I still think that there's, uh, there are uh, differences between uh, board union, although they remain in the board union school, broadly speaking, and I tend to call them post board union to emphasize uh, the lack of debt toward uh, the elder uh, master figure, uh, Pierre Bourdieu. Uh, on that, uh, maybe I'll conclude by, by taking just uh, Hugo's question uh, for a minute. Uh, and in a sense, um, to, to show in a sense uh, one of the objectives of the book, in a sense, is to show that the notion of gift exchange was never conceived to think about micro-level social relations in the first place. It became so after, indeed, the translation through Akerlov, through the work of others, to think this uh, uh, about informal contracts. So the question you ask is, can we use a concept that has some validity at the micro level to think about the micro level, in a sense, I try to say, well, it was never supposed to, th to, to help us think the micro level, but actually to think the macro level. So, so for me, the hard uh, question is, how can it be helpful to think about the micro level when, in fact, inherent in the gift exchange relations is the ability to morph into war, which is not something you can do at the micro level when you're private citizens, but which is something that you can do when you're talking about sovereign entities. And that's something that most uh, puts really much on the table is that he says, it's not because these entities can wage war against one another because they are sovereign entities and everything is possible that there's not some form of ordering uh, in their relationship and that we are not in a state of anarchy. Uh, but if you place the discussion in a context where war is not permissible as a legitimate mode of action, I'm not sure the notion of a gift exchange conceived by most, not conceived by Akalov, has any sense anymore. Uh, so that's what uh, one of the way I can... A small thing because I clarified my idea. Yeah. Right. So, you know, there is a continuous of thing. You know, all, most of relationships are partly dominated by formal contract and partly dominated by formal contract. So our relationship with the Institute, there are things which are contralized. I know how much I get paid at the end of the month. I know how much I'm supposed to teach. These are two very most important things and these are written. This event is a gift exchange. Our salary would be exactly the same, and our employment condition would be exactly the same if I'd gone for a bike ride instead of coming here, right? So, and there are hundreds of, of activities which are like this. And so, and, and there is some, uh, you know, degree of, th th there must be a reason why certain part of a relationship between two entities is dictated by formal rules. I, you know, I think any of us, other things equal, would, would prefer a job contract that specifies our salary with a job contract that the Institute says, you know, 
if we have a nice enrollment, you'll be paid more, and if you have low enrollment, you'll be paid less. But that's not the case for people who work in Wall Street, right? The people who work in Wall Street get a very a relatively low base pay for their standards, and they get you know a big component of variable pay. So <laughs> there, there are this sort of uh, sort of stuff. So there might be reasons why this is the case. And you know, and if I abstract from the fact that Moss thought whatever he thought, for me it's easier to rationalize why in micro relationship uh, there is a lot of implicit contrast. Like in a family, everything is implicit, right? Whatever 99%, 100% of the relationship with my wife are implicit. The more you extend with strangers, the more these things are going to be formalized, right? Because you know these guidelines. That's why for me it's easier to think that when you think at macro level, <coughs> it might be more formal. So that's, that was my, just my comment. <laughs> yeah, no, no, yeah, I understood your comment. I'm just saying that uh, you come from economics after the, the, the revolution where you have to explain everything by starting at the macro level. And then it makes sense at the macro level. You try to understand macro level phenomena through micro level practices. Yeah. But that comes after Moos, and Moos lives in a world in which sure. there's no attempt to explain microeconomic phenomena at the micro level. Uh, and there's always, in, in your, in, to use your metaphor, uh, if you were uh, not performing the formal parts of the contract, <coughs> you cannot kill the director of the institute without uh, uh, suffering the wrath of the state. Yeah. There's an enforcement, uh, sir, of con whereas, as Bala uh, said, Great Britain can always try to invent some new wars, uh, act as uh, Charles Tilly said, the mafiosi state, uh, in order to liquidate some debt, devalue, and do a range of stuff that actually uh, 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 make the notion of contract very fragile uh, and, and that's the universe in which uh, Mo says the notion of gift exchange makes sense. So I must wonder here whether translating prestation into gift mm -hmm. does not make prestation some kind of a super sign uh, in the translation. So I'm just wondering, you know, the, the our pension fund says prestation de sortie. Right? It's certainly not a gift that they give us when we leave. I mean, we are contributing to it. So if you swear by Moss, I don't think I'll ever support you as our nominee in the pension fund <laughs> because <laughs> you may end up translating prestatio as gift. So, you don't know. Don't worry, I will not apply to that job. <laughs> Any point to add? Or no? Maybe, maybe yeah, we can I think it would be great, yeah. um, but thanks for the discussion. Uh, so yes, one question here. Maybe we take three at, uh, at a time, and uh, yes, would you like to start? Thanks so much, Gregor. My name is Mia Hollett-Bronzer. I'm the Open and Sleepy Creative Advanced Studies, and I've been in the Global Economics Center. It's a great pleasure to find myself here today. I'll be able to join this book launch. Um, I haven't read the book, sadly, yet, but I look forward to reading it. And thank you very much for all the comments. I have a question because you mentioned the subje um, sort of subjective element and your own interest that led you to this project. I'd like to hear a bit more of that and how you contextualize your own interest with the broader moment where many people have returned to Morse. And my own field or field of uh, legal anthropology, um, in anthropology there has been quite a bit of works around Morse, which I'm sure you know and like to discuss in the book. And um, there's, for example, one paper I'm thinking of from 2012, I think, by David Graeber, where they revived the idea. And I'm, I've been quite kind of struck by this of how you understand this term. And if I may contextualize just a bit more, in anthropology, and I don't know if this applies to sociology and other disciplines, we've seen kind of a strong turn toward the classics. And there's been a very strong, it's been a noticeable move which is aimed to maybe reinstate what is at the core of our disciplinary pursuit and how we, we may sort of reinstate a very solid grounding for our collective inquiry, perhaps in a pursuit to understand how our societal role could be anchored. And one thing I've been thinking of most is that for my own research, 
I arrived from a totally different viewpoint because I look at human rights monitoring and not really the financial arrangements that um, are present in the world. But I don't know if the 2008 financial fall and the dramatic failure of economics of diverse kinds uh, to foresee that and also explain what that was about. I don't know if you are finding that could these be links, and I'm really fascinated to hear what led you to those. Is uh, gift exchange the real translation of Le Don? I don't know. But it gets a materialistic approach in English. Donner Le Don in French has, is much more innocent. So the question is, did that give you the impact to treat all this financial stuff, which you had written in French would not have been? Uh, do you treat the role of symbolic exchange in your book? Then we go to religion, which has not been covered by the panel here. And is the giver, I don't speak about gift, is the giver an anti-concept to homo economicus, or is it complementary? And the last thing is, is gift exchange economically efficient? So it's all about the concept. And the last is, is in the internet world, is that a good environment for the term? Would you like to address these two questions? Or? Sure. Um, on, on my relationship uh, with anthropology and the debates uh, spurred by uh, Greber's uh, bestseller, Dead uh, 5000 History, or was it? Per 5,000 history, uh, in, indeed, uh, which were very much related with his politics in the sense as he was part of the Occupy uh, Wall Street movement and started advocating for debt cancellation, periodic debt cancellation, and he tried to see that as uh, a, a way through which uh, societies have, uh, have uh, uh, dealt with uh, relation of uh, debtor-creditor uh, uh, bondage uh, as, as a model, in a sense. In a sense, I, I wrote that book with uh, Graeber in mind, but, uh, and I always uh, uh, find, you know, find it amusing, as I was reading Moss, to see the distance between Moss, Graeber's interpretation of the gift and Moss interpretation, especially as far as uh, his politics were concerned. Uh, because for most, there's nothing as worrying as a unilateral cancellation of a debt relationship. Uh, for instance, in his essays on the Bolsheviks, but I said, you know, he, he hated much more the Bolsheviks than he hated the international liberals. And uh, the, uh, uh, he lauded the uh, work of the economic experts who were sitting at the Reparation Commission, which could be the equivalent today of the IMF Department of Debt Sustainability Analysis. Uh, and, and he really lauded the fact that they were looking for ways for Germany to reimburse its debt. And because for him, there was no such thing as uh, 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 terrible as a uh, cancellation of debt because it, it basically cancelled the relationship. So he wanted the debt relation to last forever and never completely be repaid, but thought and wrote about <coughs> gift exchange as, a, as a, a system of partial debt swap, in a sense. But that did not destroy the debt relationship, but that basically uh, reshuffled the debt relationships uh, uh, in uh, the international society. So, um, so uh, now the, with the, the more important point about what it says about our own disciplines that we are questioning uh, the, the, the historical purpose uh, of the founding fathers of our, our discipline as a way uh, to give meaning uh, to our work. Uh, I don't know. Maybe uh, we 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 need uh, to to grow from childhood to teenage rebellious uh, 
uh, uh, years and to completely forget about uh, uh, fathers uh, and mothers, uh, often too, uh, too much fathers and mothers. Uh, but just to clarify, uh, I never thought Mouse was a founding father of my discipline because I'm not in anthropology uh, uh, trained in anthropology. I was trained in sociology, and 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 both under gift exchange occupies a, a different sort of orbit. So for me, it was more a way to to uh, accustom myself to the disciplines of my closest colleagues in the department of anthropology and sociology and to understand where they come from. And so this is my gift to them. <laughs> and I hope there will be a counter gift that they will pick up like uh, Marx and show uh, how uh, uh, his concept of economic exploitation can be reconceived in different ways, for instance. Uh, on, on, on your point, I think it's a very, it's an excellent point to clarify the, the, the topic of the book. I completely, and to understand more about the subjective criteria I used to uh, select controversies in which I find uh, an interest. And why I completely ignored, in a sense, the very rich literature on le don which in the Francophone Academia has been organized uh, around uh, different review, reviews like the Mouvement Utilitariste en Sciences Sociales, Le Revue Maus, of which Greber is very much closer. And I think Greber is actually coming through most through this angle that looks at the very micro level uh, how that notion of gift exchange can help explain non-market forms of uh, uh, economic but for the so social solidarity. So, I did not conceive gift exchange as being a translation of le don, but as being a translation of a system d'échange de prestations réciproques. And the system de prestations réciproques, I find these terms used not in daily language of people. Uh, we usually say, je vais vous faire un don. We don't say, je vais faire un échange de prestations réciproques when we are dealing with our partners, for instance. Uh, otherwise, it, we're, you are really into a motion family. Uh, 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 but we find that language in legal covenants, especially in treaties, conventions, devolution agreements. If you read the Evian Agreement, you find uh, by which uh, uh, Algeria uh, uh, accepts the framework into which its independence is going to be uh, processed. It's not a treaty, uh, but it's, it's, a, it's a legal agreement of uh, a certain uh, nature between two entities that from now on accept their own sovereignty and recognize their own sovereignty. Uh, uh, and th this is where I, I looked for uh, the concept of prestation reciproque with the hypothesis behind uh, that <coughs> against the notion that has been very much popularized in the sociology of uh, economic life, the notion of performativity, by which uh, sociologists of finance especially have tried to show how, for instance, economics as a science has a performative effect on markets, where the direction of causality goes from the academic ideas to real life operations of market. My hypothesis was the opposite, is that anthropological language itself, prestation, system de prestation reciproque, was borrowing its concept from the legal realm and from international law in particular, in that case, okay? So rather than saying Anthropology of the gift exchange, l'anthropologie des prestations réciproques, has shaped the Versailles Treaty, said, okay, most has read the Versailles Treaty, is part of these commentators with Bloom, Albert Thomas, etc., who comment on the Versailles Treaty, especially the provisions on reparations where they find these notions of prestation. What do they bring by bringing this notion to the core of anthropology? How do they change that legal notion what do they add when they said it comes with rituals? It's coming with uh, 
certain uh, manifestations that we can describe across societies. And what role do they uh, give to anthropology when they want to participate in these debates, where uh, mostly international law scholars and uh, diplomats and states <coughs> were involved? So, so that's pretty much the hypothesis. And, and, and that's the limitation of the book, is that I'm not speaking of le don and how people give to one another, where indeed uh, the, the importance of religion would be much The working better. of these people, of these actors, is it conscious, conscient, or is it inconscient? My selection? They know. When they make these treaties, or okay. they are... They know that they are in a gift exchange, or they don't know? Well, they know that they are in a system de prestation reciproque because they define the prestation reciproque in it's the language concept. of the titan. Yeah, it's a, it's a concept that you find uh, uh, in all these provisions. And, and in a sense that I, I selected the legal agreements first, the Versailles Treaty, the Chartered Company Statutes of the late 19th century, the Avian Agreement. And after I selected the associated <coughs> work of anthropologists who participated in the controversies about their, uh, over the interpretation of their meanings. So that explains to you a little bit more uh, my selection criteria, which is not purely subjective, but uh, deep inside. Any other questions? Yes? Um, but, but having this kind of very set criteria, there's, um, there's a sense in which what you describe is a kind of echo chamber, the concept of gift exchange, which is actually relatively fixed. Now, to what extent is that echo chamber a real one, or is it one that's been created by your kind of selection criteria? Because, of course, although a lot of the debates in anthropology were about micro gift exchange, I mean, mm -hmm. um, but these debates have been going on since the 40s, and they've spilled over beyond the micro in some cases to think in more general terms. I mean, silence is the obvious one of thinking in not just in kind of particular transactions. So was there a kind of echo chamber here going on? Was it one idea which was rattling about, or was it something which actually you created? And one question, one comment about that, about a pension en primauté de prestation is a gift exchange. <laughs> He's a true Geneva citizen. So. And, and, and a lot, lot of experience of working with pension funds, I'm sure. <laughs> no, but, uh, I have in various countries. I will not answer to the later comment uh, on the, the right qualification for our uh, pension uh, funds uh, obligations. Um, I think that indeed there's, a, there's an element of me constructing the object as such. Uh, and indeed, as a good constructivist, I will never say that I stumbled on that object and, uh, and just pick it up and put it in the same basket. Uh, and I, I think that's actually part of the, the, what interested me is to construct this object and to construct an object by that uh, and keeping some symmetry uh, to it in the sense that I, in, in different periods, both the colonial and the post-colonial period, I try to see how this notion of uh, prestation reciproque, you see, we, we no longer talk about gift exchange, but, uh, I make a precise statement about what we are talking about. In the context of international solidarity within Europe and between Europe and the rest of the world, between Global North and Global South. So because I, I think that's part of uh, uh, the ambition was also to show how a concept that could be used in the colonial context to frame relations of economic exchange between the metropolis and the colony could then be used to frame the relationship between France and Germany, for instance, within the European context. At the same time as the concepts of the new international order, which try to reframe, to work with the notion of gift exchange, but very much against the notion of gift exchange, uh, 
as it was uh, uh, found in the Avian Agreement, for instance, and in many devolution contracts uh, where you had sort of forced bilateralism between the former colony and the newly independent state. Uh, uh, they were redeployed also in the European context with the Eurozone crisis. So, so in a sense, that's how I, I structure the symmetry in the book and, and the, the, the chapters, and, and indeed, there may be an element of construction, and, uh, and uh, I wouldn't say that. Uh, now, at the same time, um, but that would open a whole range of uh, di discussion where, at the same time, I think the, that notion of gift exchange has very much shifted uh, from <coughs> the, the times of most to the times of uh, uh, Soustel and the European integration. And I think that maybe uh, it's important to understand gift exchange in relation to the notion of integration and that the two mean very different things, that gift exchange may mean something very different if you don't back it up with the notion of integration, if you don't relate it to the notion of integration. But that may look very abstract, and, and maybe it's too late to open that front. Uh, I just wanted to mention, in case you have not noticed, you can read the PDF online for free without breaking any law. So it's a general gift of the Front National Suisse <laughs> uh, to make it available on open access for free, so uh, you don't need to buy the book. Uh, we don't. We refuse market exchange. It works. It's true. I <laughs> I checked the link and it's it works. True. Yes. Yes. Um, great. So I think uh, we will uh, close the event here. But uh, yes, I would say thanks for presenting thanks uh, to us your book. Uh, it's actually really interesting, and I think indeed you've shown very well how it can be relevant to different disciplines and different uh, contemporary debates. Uh, I, I mean, I also read the last chapter on the European Union and so on, and I found it uh, that it works. So we can really learn through Marcel Moss. So thanks a lot. Thank you. Thank you.